I'm going to be reading from 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verses 19 through 23. It says, For though I am free from all men, I have made myself a slave to all, that I might win the more. And to the Jews I became as a Jew, that I might win Jews. To those who are under the law, as under the law, though not being myself under the law, that I might win those who are under the law. To those who are without law, as without law, though not being without the law of God, but under the law of Christ, that I might win those who are without law. To the weak I became weak, that I might win the weak. I have become all things to all men, that I may by all means save some. And I do all things for the sake of the gospel, that I may become a fellow partaker of it. Good morning. morning. Aren't you wonderful? This is a good place to be. I, uh, matter of fact, Drew, by the way, you're a pistol, dude. Okay, I like the way that you did the Lord's Supper, and I like the thought that you put into it. And apparently the trending topic for today is love, because my tie, when I was wearing it, says God loves you in about 30 different languages. So it's a good day to be talking about love, and that's what we're going to be doing. Michael, good singing. Um, but you know that I have to start with a song, so here we go. You are beautiful beyond description, too marvelous for words, too wonderful for comprehension, like nothing ever seen or heard. Who can grasp your infinite wisdom? Who can fathom the depths of your love? You are beautiful beyond description, majesty enthroned above. And I stand, I stand in awe of you. I stand, I stand in awe of you. Only God to whom all praise is due. I stand in awe of you. Be seated, please. Okay, Brother Jackie, I don't know where you had this clip, so why don't you just clip it? Everybody ought to be good for something. <laughs> Thank you, my sir. Okay, God right. is good, isn't he? All the time, and all the time, God is good. Well, <clears throat> I'm getting a little older since I was here last time. Uh, these two older couples were sitting together and enjoying an evening together in each other's house. And so the two women get up and go to the kitchen. And the men are talking to each other. And one of them said, man, I ate at this greatest restaurant last night. And the other one said, well, what was the name of it? He said, hmm, let's see, what was the name? He said, what is that flower with thorns on it? that's red that you give somebody when you love them and he said it's a rose and he said hey rose where did we eat last night <laughs> and michael that's what you have to look forward to as you get older dude <clears throat> okay so let's talk about something that very seldom maybe uh do we hear uh, among us and that is uh, adaptability to culture in the church of christ or in the in the bible and as we talk about that today, it's very important that we understand that you understand what I'm saying. Even though it is true that there are some things that don't change, there are some things that are objective, that you can know for sure, that doesn't mean that everything is in that category. As a matter of fact, there is some room for some gray areas in the church. Did I say that? Yes. And what is a gray area? A gray area is something that's neither right nor wrong, but it's kind of in the middle. Now, if you're talking to a person who is a black and white thinker, he has just turned me off. Why? Because to a black and white thinker, there is no gray area. It's either a debit or it's, a, or, or it's an asset. 
you know, and it's got to go in this category, it's got to go in this category, but I'm going to tell you that God knows that there are some areas concerning which it's going to be difficult for us to all agree. Why? Because we come from different backgrounds and different places, etc. And one of my tasks this weekend is to talk about millennials. Let me say first of all, thank you. I want to say thank you to Jackie and Francis for arranging for us to be here and, and you know, picking us up at the airport and stuff. And Terry and Nancy, we had a great time with them yesterday. Terry took us around and showed us a lot of uh, beautiful things around here. There are many, many, many beautiful places to go. We looked at four peaks from the distance, and, and uh, he was thinking, I hiked up there once, and I'm thinking, where's the helicopter? Okay, <laughs> I am probably not going to make it up there. Okay, and so there are some beautiful places around here. That's, that's wonderful. I want to thank you for being you. I want to thank you for inviting me here to talk about this most difficult topic because uh, it does bring up a lot of different ideas and different opinions I noticed, Michael, that you chose some older songs today, and you chose some younger songs today, and you had a stand up, and then you uh, did a little this and a little of that, and I noticed that, uh, Drew, uh, you were reverent during the Lord's Supper, but very, you're original and very, I, I'm assuming that's your personality, uh, if you're married, I will pray for your wife, okay, but I, I really enjoyed what you did, is that your name, Drew, where are you? Uh, wherever you are, let me just say that I enjoyed that. Okay, and thank you for, for, what you, what, for what you did to make us think about what would Jesus post on, on, the, on public media if he were today. That was a very original way of doing that. So having said those things, we go into this area about are there gray areas in Scripture, and apparently so. The Word of God anticipates that culture is going to change during the time that Jesus tarries. In other words, we don't know when he's going to return. Matthew 24, verse 36, we have no idea. At the time that Jesus said that, he didn't even know. I think he knows now, but he didn't know then. Not anybody but God. Not even the angels in heaven knew when he was coming back. So the Bible was made to last till that time. When we appear before the judgment seat of Christ and we're judged according to the things done in the body. Where the books will be opened and another book is opened, which is the book of life where we all have to do what the, are judged by the Word of God in John 12, verse 48. That day, I don't know when it's coming. But to say that the Bible doesn't anticipate millennials is just plain dumb. Okay, in other words, to say that somehow or another the Bible didn't anticipate that the millennials were coming along. Now, millennials, I love you, but let me just tell you, you don't rule the world. All right, on the other hand, you do rule a lot of places that are targets of evangelism for us. Because if you rule out the millennials as a target for evangelism, then who are you going to evangelize? You might, you might go evangelize some in nursing homes and in assisted living areas, and that would be good if you do that. But your prime target for evangelism is millennials. Those that have been born since 1983. Let's see your hands. Hands up. Born since 1983. It's okay to raise your hands. Okay, you mean, okay. All right, so a lot of them maybe are in classes, but that means if I didn't see a lot of hands up, we got some work to do. And the work to do is you need older people and you need younger people and you need people in the middle. And if you don't have that, then at some point the church at this location could die out. And so it is important that we think about trying to evangelize the world, and that does include those who have been born since 1983. The Word of God anticipates changing times. Uh, this doesn't look exactly the way that it does on my computer, so I'm going to go with it anyway. Let me just say the spacing is a little off, but that would also be true of me. Okay, so um, what, how did Paul use this principle that was just read in your hearing? Number one, he felt he was compelled to preach. I don't have a choice not to preach. I had a person to say to me, uh, matter of fact, he was teaching preparation and delivery of sermons when I was a student. I didn't appreciate much what he said, but here's what he said. Don't preach if you don't have to. Don't preach if you don't have to. And what he meant by that was, do you feel that you are compelled, that you have a mission from God? I have a tie, a mission from God. Okay, do you feel that you have indeed a mission from God to do this? Do you feel that this is something that you cannot not do? I was a math major and was perfectly happy. Matter of fact, as a math major, I wanted to fly in the Air Force, 
but I've got one eye that crosses the other eye about eight degrees or so. It's a genetic eye weakness, and uh, you really don't want your pilot saying, which of these runways do you want me to land at here? <laughs> so my eyes are just a little bit out of alignment, and there's no screw to adjust it like on a car. All right, so I, I can't really do that. It kept me out of the Air Force, but they said I could fly commercially, and that should make you feel good the next time you get on a plane. <laughs> but I could fly commercially, and so that was my plan. And then stuff happened. You know, Freed Hardman was a two-year school at that time, and by, you know, you were a senior when you were a sophomore. And it was a two-year school, and I was a math major and happy with it. And then people started talking to me about being a Bible major and want to be a Bible major, you know, because, um, you know, those are the, you know, the Bible majors on campus all had pencil protectors, you know, right here <laughs> that you would put in your pocket. And they carried a briefcase and they all had that look about them that somehow or another they had been there before. Okay, and another thing is they just kind of levitated across campus. They didn't actually walk. Okay, and so, and, and I thought, man, I do not want to be a Bible major. But uh, that's the way preachers, by the way, my wife did not want to marry a preacher. And some of you said, well, she succeeded. Okay, but nonetheless, she did not want to marry a preacher because she grew up as a preacher's kid. And she decided that she wanted to do something else. And except God got a hold of us and we started considering things. And we started considering where God wants to put you, where he wants to plant you, and how he wants you to use your gifts for him. So when I say preaching, I'm not just talking about preaching. I'm talking about every one of you who teaches the Word of God. So what do you have to deal with? Well, first of all, I want you to understand that you need to feel a mission and a strong pull to do this. Because if you're in the classroom, it takes the students about 15 seconds to figure out whether or not you want to be there or you don't want to be there. If you want to be there, they can sense that. If you don't want to be there, they can sense that. And if you're there just trying to hang on until retirement or whatever else, they can tell that very quickly. So if you don't feel good about teaching, I, I'm, I don't know who lines up your teachers here, but I'm going to say to you, maybe it's time that you step back and look at that or understand what it is that you're doing until you can get to the point that you can feel good about stepping back in that classroom. Because you are molding the future, not only now, but in heaven you are doing that. So that means then that I've got to understand that I teach students from a lot of different backgrounds, a lot of different places. And a lot of, I have students from California. I have students from various countries. And, and as, as we think about that, how do you try to pull them all together? Well, first of all, this principle Paul uses of adaptability in the church is to understand you're not always going to be preaching to Jews just because you're a Jew. He is a Jew, and I'm sure that God would have... Would have uh, Paul would have thought this in, in Acts 26, verses 16 through 18, where when he was converted, God said, I'm going to put you as a chosen vessel to the Gentiles. And Paul, I'm sure, is thinking, are you serious? I got this Ivy League Jewish education here. I graduated from the school of Gamaliel. I was of the tribe of Benjamin. I was a Hebrew among Hebrews. Philippians chapter 3, and you're going to put me doing what? I am going to be an apostle to the Gentiles. But I don't understand those people, God. How is it that I can, how are you going to put me here when I have not spent much time with that? If you will look in your Bible in Acts 13, you will see that there is a point where Paul does try to be a minister to the Jews and with he and Barnabas, it does not work out. And so the text tells you at the end of Acts 13 that they turn toward the Gentiles. Now to do that, what do you have to do? Well, that means I now have to learn another culture. I've got to learn something different. Let me tell you, two of our kids were born, two of our grandkids were born in the Dominican Republic. Habla un poquito de español. Okay, I do not speak much Spanish. All right, and, 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 and what do we find here? Well, our daughter Rachel is in Santiago, Dominican Republic, and she's, uh, you know, in labor, and, and she speaks Spanish, and my son-in-law speaks Spanish, and I don't speak Spanish. All right, and so 
What are you going to do? Well, you're going to try to figure out a way to make it work. Why? Because your grandson, in this case, and granddaughter, the second child was a granddaughter, are going to be born in this country where primarily they speak Spanish, and they speak very little English except where the tourists come in. I mean, they speak, her doctor spoke not near a word of English. You know, and most of her nurses did not either. Well, what do you do in a situation like that? You learn as much as you can about the culture. You learn to adapt, and you do what you can. I even learned how to say Big Mac no onion in Spanish. You know, you do not know. You, you may not need to know that, but I, I learned it. No saboya. Okay, and I don't know. I don't want any of that onion on, that, on there. And so, what's the deal here? Okay, who are you going to preach to? Well, I'm going to preach in my culture all your life, all my life. Well, if you do, you're still going to find out that your culture is changing. And that more and more people in Mesa are Hindus and Buddhists and Muslims and other things. Even if you decide to stay in your own culture, your culture is going to change. So that means I'm going to have to learn the difference in things. I noticed yesterday, uh, Terry, when we went to the lake, that there was apparently some sort of a Hispanic re reunion going on. And they were having a wonderful time there. And they had... Uh, t-shirts uh, that my wife noticed that she that they had color-coded t-shirts various families and things uh, let me just tell you that our family reunions we ain't ever done that all right uh, in other words uh, that apparently is something really good about a lot of Hispanic families is that they get together on occasions like that and they have a really good time being together as a family and I was kind of envious why because let me just tell you a lot of white people don't do that and, and apparently some Hispanics do that, and apparently some black people do that, and a lot of people don't have the opportunity to get together to enjoy that because it's not part of their culture. I liked what I saw. They were having a good time, and they were learning what it was like to be as a family. Number two, if he preached voluntarily, he had his reward. Number three, if he preached involuntarily, he had a stewardship. In other words, if he preached because he wanted to, then someday the reward would be given to him because he was a preacher. But if he preached involuntarily, which is what he's trying to say to you, and that is, I cannot not do this. It's involuntary. I feel as though I'm compelled to do this. Then I look at it as though it were a stewardship, which means God has put me in charge of this, and I must do the best that I can with what God has put me in charge with. That means now that I've got to decide. I've got to decide what are the things that can change in the church and what are the things that cannot change in the church. And finally, he offered the gospel at no cost to them. But frankly, Paul sometimes uh, was supported by the people locally and sometimes he was not. So now, what does that mean? That means that not everything is black and white with regard to cultural things. And if I'm preaching... Like, for instance, in Tanzania, I preached in Tanzania um, at least three times in Africa. Our girls uh, that went with us on a campaign on that trip, they wore skirts that were very modest to me. And I told them, carry the longest skirts that you can, because whenever you represent the church in the town of Moshi or in the town of Arusha, Tanzania, that they expect you to, to dress appropriately. So they brought their longest skirts. But with two girls, they were not intending to be immodest, but with two girls, when they sat down, you could see their knees. Now this is going to be difficult to explain to you, but there are cultures in parts of Africa where having, not having a top on is considered to be modest. But if they see your knees, ladies, they are going to assume that you are a loose woman. And so some of the women kind of got together and said about some of our teenage girls, uh, can you do something about that? So we had to have this discussion with them. I said, I don't know what the longest stuff is that you have, but whatever it is, make it longer. You know, and, and make it such that when you sit down that your knee will not be exposed because you're drawing attention away from the gospel message. Another thing is, don't wear pants if you are door knocking in some parts of the world. Because women are expected to wear a skirt or a dress, and if you wear pants, it says the wrong thing to that culture. So do you know what we did? We said, 
You know, you can wear pants or modest shorts on your day off. You may not do that if we are door knocking or if we are in the campaign itself or if we're there in the gospel meeting. Why? Because you're in another country now. And being in another country, even their standards of modesty may differ. And so we want to become all things to all people that we might any means save some. Now, is it wrong for a woman to wear a, a skirt that's, you know, slightly above her knees in our culture? I would say no. But I would also say that it's one of those things that's very significant if you go to other parts of the world, and so you have to know how the people are thinking. All right, here's another one. Mate is a big stuff. I've been to Buenos Aires, Argentina five or six times, and I've preached down there. Again, I don't speak Spanish, and I'm always working through an interpreter. One time when I was down there, I was trying to teach them that Christians should do what they are designed to do. And then I made the mistake of trying to do a cross-cultural thing and tell them about duct tape. Now, here in the United States, we know that duct tape can even hold on the bumper of a car. We know that duct tape can be used for any... If you have three tools that you need if your car breaks down, you need a screwdriver, you need wire pliers, and you need duct tape. All right, and so if you say, well, I, I, that's good in our culture, except the guy who was translating for me thought I was saying, wah, 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 tape. Okay, and so I was trying to communicate that duct tape doesn't do what it's supposed to do because if you put it on ducts, you know, ducts, whenever you put them on ducts and they get moist, it comes loose. So duct tape is not supposed to do what it's supposed to do. So the audience was amused. And the reason that they were amused is because they were thinking, why is he taping up a duck? You know, why is he doing that? Well, I made a cross-cultural mistake. In other words, I was trying to make that. So you know when I left Buenos Aires, those wonderful people down there, they sent me home with a roll of duct tape. Okay. <laughs> wonderful people. i tell you something else they will do. They will drink mate, which looks like the stuff under your lawnmower. It's kind of some sort of uh, herb thing, non-hallucinogenic. But nonetheless, people in Argentina, in Paraguay, and Uruguay drink this and one of the things that they will do is that sometimes they will pass it during church from one person to the next so that you can drink it is a sign of fellowship and you do not refuse because there's hot water in here and you have this little mate cup and the mate is on the inside and then you have this little sipper straw and you're supposed to drink it till it slurps now if you do that here you don't slurp in America. Why? Because the restaurant will go crazy. You know, you don't slurp. But it's okay to do that in Buenos Aires. It's a broad world with many values. Is it wrong to drink mate in church? No. Is it wrong, for instance, for a woman to have on a skirt that is fully modest in the United States, but might not be modest in Africa? Well, now we're in a gray area. And the gray area is, the dress is not inherently immodest, but it's causing the wrong thinking in that culture. So when you do that, you hear Paul saying, if meat makes my brother to offend, I will eat no more meat as long as the world shall stand. 1 Corinthians 8 and verse 13. Let me use another illustration. Let's say now that we have a, uh, it's the church at Rome now. Now we're in Romans 14 and 15 and we're talking about more things that are kind of in the gray area. Now they're going to have a potluck meal just like we're going to have a potluck meal. Except it's going to be difficult for them because some of them are converted Jews and some of them are converted Greeks or Gentiles from a pagan environment. Now the Jewish woman who was brought up as a Jew and has become a Christian, she's walking down the table to see what she will put on her plate. Now what's she thinking? I'm from the land of catfish and barbecue, which is West Tennessee. All right, and so we have a lot of barbecue and we have a lot of catfish, neither of which a Jew is supposed to eat according to the old law. 
The catfish does not have scales and the cloven hoof deal for the pig. And so what are you going to do? Well, she wants to be unified with the rest of the church, but she was brought up as a Jew. To be brought up as a Jew, does she have to eat barbecue in order to be a Christian? What's the answer? No. Would it offend her, maybe, if there was a dish there that was that way? Maybe it would be smart, ladies or guys, whoever fixes the dish here, if you put pork on this, on this dish. The same thing would be true if you convert a Muslim. He or she's been brought up thinking, we don't eat pork. So why don't you label that and put it on the table, rather than somebody passing by saying, I don't really know if I can do that. Now, I hate apricots in every form you can think of. But there was a woman in Middle Tennessee who thought, I have the best apricot casserole in the world. I've learned since then that I should not tell people what I don't like because somebody's going to say, I have the, exactly the perfect way to do that, and you cannot disguise apricot. Okay, and so she made, we ate at her house, and she made us a apricot casserole and some other stuff that I could eat and of course she watched me as I put this in my mouth it lay there like a brick <laughs> there is nothing that I could do you're in one of those bad situations where you can't get it up and you can't get it down you just can't you know and so she said brother Ralph how do you like it and I just said what a dish <laughs> you know because there are times when you've been parts of the world where you're going to eat some truly strange things. But we don't eat strange things here in our country, do we? No. Where I'm from, some people eat chitlins, which is another way of saying sliced pig bowels fried. Okay, and I have not gone to that level yet, but I am from that culture. All right, so here's the Jewish woman, and she doesn't know exactly what to do. Now behind her, is a Greek woman. Now, she was converted out of the synagogues, the pagans. Let's say she came from the temple of Athena. And she was converted out of believing in Athena. And therefore, she is walking down this way. And she's wondering if any of this meat has been purchased at a meat market where they would customarily get the meat from the pagan temples and then provide it to the public. In other words, if there's a Joe's meat market there, he's going to get meat from the temple of Zeus. He'll get meat from the temple of Aphrodite. He'll get meat from the temple of Athena and various other places. And that's called meat sacrifice to an idol. So in the Bible, what are you going to do? Well, she's passing these plates, but she doesn't know because... She doesn't know which of these plates came from originally a pagan temple. And she doesn't know what to do. Now tell me how they're going to get together as the church. The converted Jews and the converted pagans being at the same place. And you think we have difficulties because we have, by the way, congratulations Mesa for having a very eclectic membership. I like it. I like to see Hispanics and African Americans and white people all together in the church. I love seeing that. But it is not always easy. So Paul gives us some principles. What time do I have to quit, Brother Jack? Okay, so Paul gives, me some, gives us some principles in Romans to help us to get through these tough times. Now this afternoon, I'm going to invite you to come back because we're going to get specific. And I'd rather, I'm going to be honest with you here, not that I would ordinarily be dishonest, but I'm going to tell you that we're going to look at some difficult ideas in the afternoon session about some strategies of how maybe to do some things to make the millennials feel better about visiting us and about becoming members of the Lord's church. We're going to talk about those strategies this afternoon. And uh, so I've reserved that for the last because I'm assuming that some of your most regular members 
uh, will be able to come here this afternoon. I want all of you to be serious about your religion, and I'm not saying that you're not. But I know that when I talk to this afternoon session, it's going to be a tough audience because you're going to be sleepy. Okay, so let's just say then that here is the unity of the, uh, in diversity. Number one, a sense of acceptance. That we get from the Bible because these two groups, there were two groups that were uh, on several different sides of, of at least three issues. Issue number one, do you eat meat or do you eat vegetables? Let me just tell you, I'm a serious carnivore. And I, brought, I was brought up thinking that you have to have, some animal has to die if I'm going to eat. Okay, so that's, that's the way that I was brought up. But we have a daughter who's pretty much a vegan except for occasional seafood and occasional chicken. I don't mind her being that, and she, of course, is very healthy. She's about as big as my left leg. You know, she is a, she's a very health-conscious person, and, and that's fine unless she starts getting all preachy about it. And if she starts getting all preachy about it, then we're going to have some problems. Why? Which means there are some people that were kind of getting preachy about whether or not to eat vegetables or to eat meat in the first century church. And apparently, this was some sort of an issue for them, although it's difficult to put, put a, a flesh on exactly what the problem was. But it was a problem. And it was a problem in the first century, so we should not expect that it's not going to be a problem today. And by the way, if you choose to, to eat a, a vegetarian diet, you have the right to do that. And if you choose to be a carnivore or an omnivore or whatever like myself, then you have the right to do that. But what you don't have a right to do is to split the church over it. Now, that's what you don't have the right to do. All right, so number two, and there were problems apparently with somebody judging the servants of other people, kind of like jerking up somebody else's child and, and, and disciplining them. And therefore, uh, we don't know exactly the circumstances of this in verse 4, but Paul is saying, if you are together as a group, be careful how you make judgments. about. A, now, when I was growing up, it was okay to discipline somebody else's child. Let me just tell you, in Middle Tennessee, when I grew up, you could be spanked by the whole church. Okay, you know, uh, and that was the way that it was. But now, things are different, are they not? And if that's the case, then, how are you going to get along? Well, you can have your attitude about discipline, or you can have, you know, a, another opinion about discipline. Oh, by the way, what you don't have a right to do is to uh, let your child be so disruptive as to disrupt the entire assembly for the entire time. Now, many of us knew that if our parents took us out of the assembly and when we came back into the assembly, we were going to be a reformed individual. <laughs> okay? But I do know that times have changed, but I do understand here there's some room for disagreement about this, and I'm really not trying to hurt you in any way if I might disagree with you about some ways to bring up a child. Number three, observance of special days. Remember the Jews had one idea? Because they got that menorah. That menorah indicates the 12 feast days of the Jews. Or the seven, if you see one with seven. But the point is, is that that menorah tells you that the feast days are important. If you've been a Jew your whole life, and now it's time for Passover. Right now, by the way, it is about the time in April. It is uh, between the time of Passover and Pentecost. So you cannot exactly think no thoughts at all about Passover and Pentecost if you've observed it your whole life before you became a Christian. And then there's among us, maybe of a difference of opinion about Halloween and Christmas. What exactly do you do at Christmas? I was brought up in a super strict house where we, my mother didn't even send religious Christmas cards because she wanted no allusions to the fact that it was a religious holiday. And I married a woman who's got about 50 nativity sets. Okay, now that, that, I'm just telling you that that is a, this was not part of the deal. All right, because I grew up with one, thinking one way about Christmas, and then I married somebody who thought another way about Christmas, and guess who won? Okay, and so there's a difference. If you can make it through the holidays, and you're a newlywed, you're probably going to be just fine. If you can make it through the holidays. So both groups belong to the Lord, so why don't you try to accept each other rather, tr rather than trying to exclude each other? This is a place where we try to accept. We don't try to push out or push away. 
Because the church is about acceptance if there's any way that we can find a way to accept. Let me use one more illustration. The Church of Christ is not as strong here as it is where I'm from. There are 1,500 churches of Christ within a 150-mile radius of where I am from. How far out west would you have to go to find 1,500 churches of Christ? All right, so the question then is, it's even more important for you the more scarce the congregations are. Because the disadvantage of having a lot of churches of Christ is that if a guy gets mad over here, he can go within a stone's throw to another church of Christ over here where they'll fully accept whatever it is the problem is. And so you can swap sheep, and it is too easy to swap sheep. Therefore, some congregation says, well, we're really growing. we got 100 members. Well, how'd you get them? Well, this church over here split. Well, you are sheep shuffling when you do that. You are not really bringing new people to Christ. You're not really evangelizing if that's what you, is that if you're saying, yeah, we're growing. And by the way, if you are from another congregation and you enjoy worshiping at Mesa more than where you were from, I'm not condemning you at all. I am saying that is not a substitute for evangelism. It is not a substitute for evangelism. Therefore, we want to accept people. That's what we do. The Lord uh, did his best to accept everyone that he could until, of course, they crossed the line that he could no longer cross. Number two, a sense of judgment. What kind of judgment? Well, in 14 and 13, don't judge each other. Well, I got to judge you because you ain't from the South. All right, I'm from the South. You're from the Southwest. Okay, and, and being from the South, if you ain't from the South, you ain't ever going to be from the South. Because we know about stuff like whenever you said, Jackie, I love you, brother, but you said we hired a guy. I knew exactly what you meant. You said we hired this guy? Yeah, well, that's Southern. Okay, and, and, and to say that, for instance, on our car, we changed the oil. You know, because it's too hard for Southerners to say oil. Okay, and so we can't say oil. There was a place outside of uh, Mount Pleasant, Tennessee, where I'm from, called the Fire Tower. There's a double whammy, because to us it was the far tart. Okay, but Fire Tower. I have honestly, you know, practiced in front of the mirror before in preaching to try to not sound quite so Southern. Uh, you say, well, it didn't work. Okay, but the idea is a sense of judgment. Don't set traps for each other. Don't try to find a way to trap somebody else. If indeed you're in the church, try to find a way to get along if it is at all possible. At all possible. No food is unclean in and of itself, according to Paul. So if there is a person who can't eat meat sacrificed to an idol, who was formerly a pagan, and it doesn't bother them, then let them do it. Because what is it? A gray area. It is neither right nor wrong. It is a gray area. Which means if you can do this without violating your conscience, Acts 14, 20, I'm sorry, Romans 14, 23, and 1 Corinthians 8, 13, then you may do this. But don't violate your conscience. Because if you do that, that's like taking the battery out of the smoke detector in your house. Because you get tired, because we have a really super sensitive one that even if you... If your toast is a little brown, it goes off, which makes me not only want to disconnect it, but to pull it off the wall. All right, and so, so I'm tempted to take the battery out. But if you really have a fire, notice I said fire. If you really have a fire, then you better have that battery in your detector. So don't violate your conscience. It is your warning system that you are about to violate your value system. Sunedesis in Greek. Number three, we need to all have a sense of the kingdom of God because the kingdom of God is righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Spirit. If you have people who have righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Spirit, they enjoy being with one another, and if they were to have to break fellowship, it would be something that they would miss grievously. Why? Because you love the church that much, and you love the people that much. You see, withdrawing fellowship from somebody has no impact if they already have withdrawn fellowship from you. Because they don't miss it anyway. It's like somebody saying, I'm going to take away, you know, that aching tooth that you have. I'm kind of thinking, 
Have at it. You know, because I am not going to miss it. And then finally, and I do mean finally, there is a sense of mutual support. Which means this is the place where people help people go to heaven. This is a place where people communicate with other people. This is a place where people know more about you than just the fact that your name is so-and-so or that you live at some place. As we passed your house, Kevin, uh, uh, yesterday wandering around, uh, he says, now Kevin and Wendy live over there, you know, uh, near a tower of some kind. And, and then we saw some of your horses in the back and that kind of stuff. But the thing is, in the church, we don't just need to know random, incidental facts about each other. You're going to have to know me pretty well to spur me on to love and good works. 2 Timothy chapter 1. Why? Because sometimes I don't want to be spurred. Sometimes I don't want to go on to love and to good works because I want you to leave me alone. And yes, my wife is good about knowing that. There are times when I just need to be alone and hopefully that's not a lot because I love for her to travel with me wherever we go but if you can develop this in the church as a relationship thing you got something really really strong here it seems to me that you're well on the way to have this at Mesa that is although you're culturally diverse is it possible to be of the same mind can you glorify God with one voice which is what the text says can you accept one another? Can you help one another to go to heaven? Recently I saw a retired elder from Campbell Street where I worked for 24, where we worked for 24 years. He's in the hospital and uh, stage four prostate cancer. And uh, it was not easy to see him in this way. But I could not not go see him. Because when I had a heart attack in 2001, this was a pretty much a surprise to us. When I had a heart attack in 2001, this same elder came to the hospital in Jackson and stayed right with Joyce through the entire time of the diagnosis, the, stent, the places, placement of the stents, until, you know, my situation was stable he just stayed. You know, it's not difficult to go see him in the hospital now that he's in his 80s because I remember 15 years ago. And so, if you develop that, you will find a way to decide about controversial stuff. You'll find a way. Do you have a praise team or do you not have a praise team? Is it okay to raise hands or is it not okay to raise hands? Is it okay to clap or is it not okay to clap? If you love each other this way, to the extent that you want to help one another go to heaven, you will find a way. It is not about this weekend trying to find ways to divide this church, but you don't have enough millennials here. And you got wonderful people here, but when I had the people who were millennials to hold up their hands, there wasn't more than 30. So one of the things that God may place on the hearts of the elders is that what do we do to try to be evangelistic as we used to be. I understand that the church at one time here used to be seven or 800 people. And I understand that there are always going to be difficult times to go through where one group agrees or disagrees. Sometimes a separation is not necessarily a bad thing. Because if there are options, it's not necessarily a bad thing for somebody to worship in an environment where they're more comfortable as long as there is not this idea that we are a true church of Christ and you are not. And once you develop that, the community can feel that. And when you go communicate and when you go contacting the community, 
and you say you're from the church of Christ and they're gonna say well which one because I've heard about this and then I've heard about this you are really hurting evangelism find everything that you can older people to understand the younger generation and to really say we do have a problem here because a lot of our kids are not going to the church anymore and to the younger people may I say some of us have had enough water under the bridge that we do understand a few things and we're not necessarily impotent or imbecilic just because we happen to be AARP so let us find a way to support one another to provoke unto love and to good works through faith and repentance and confession and baptism in the Lord Jesus Christ you are in the body which is the greatest place in the world to be in the body in the body when you are baptized the Lord adds you to the body and you know you will be there unless you intend to extract yourself for one reason or another you will be in the body until the day that you die the question will be will you be faithfully working for the Lord in the body or will you be in absentia while we stand and sing